little sacred, and it blesses my heart, and it lifts up my spirit. And I couldn't say, but it just just gives you a boost. Does it do you that way? For me to get to come to an old day singing, it gives me something to go in the next week that, that nothing else gives me. I'm elevated. I forget the things maybe that I've been thinking of seriously, maybe some words that I have. I can forget those words and I can look at, I can listen to those singings and those songs and I'm, I feel better. I forget this, my worries for the time being. And uh, even the worry doesn't, uh, it doesn't come back so soon. It's, it's, an, it's an uplifting thing to me. To me, sacred heart music is sacred music as it's written. There are, I know there's a lot of it in a lot of the songs in the book that uh, do not seem to be so much in line with the old sacred songs that we use. But after all, it's when they're sung right down to the meaning and to the importance of it, it's sacred music. As you see these people sing, as you see them singing with conviction, this is not just something that's done at a sing and then forgotten about and put up on a shelf till they dust off the Sacred Harp book again. I think it's a reflection of a genuine way of life. Within the best traditions of Judeo-Christianity, these are people from the Bible Belt by and large, although up in New England now they're having sings in Michigan. But in its, its pure, unadulterated form uh, in Georgia and Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Florida, Texas, you're still having the sing, or at least vestiges of the pure Sacred Harp sings. Preston, Preston Crowder, be the next director. Yes. Three seventy six. Why do I come? 
Well, the first uh, basic principle of it is because it's based on the gospel of Christ Jesus, the Bible. My mother in 1911, when my father re revised the uh, James Revision back in 1911, my mother was over in Atlanta with him doing the work for J.S. Joel, J. Joel James. And she put the scripture references at the head of these songs, if you see in the second half. You see the scripture references? But well, she did that back then. My mother was well educated in her day, and she knew the Bible well, and she taught me the way of life. Well, my grandfather, as my father, grandfather, and father told us, by listening to some older people sing, we didn't know what they were singing, but we'd get in the kitchen, me and my brother, and sing on the floor. But later, I was taught by Bob Davis, Thomas Lawrence, and Jerry Jackson. Them were the three that really taught me what music was. One of them was white, the other two was black. They taught me what music was and how to sing. Way back, before some of you don't know anything about it, they saw old folks would sing this song. They thought about them old people, how sort of condition they were in. They said, oh, oh, oh. Who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the kingdom land. on the hard slavery. They'd been beat and robbed. They left head beat them up. They said, my heart and Sacred Heart singers in general are close and are emotional and, and feel love for one another more so than some people I've seen. I think it brings them, I think it gives them an extra element of closeness. So that they have something in common, something to touch. They're close knit people. Everybody seems like kin folks. They're singing all denominations of people, but when they come together to a singing, they're all one, just like one. When you go to a church, you've got one denomination. You would think it's one denomination. But in here, there's all denominations together, and their voices are blending together, and there's no little eyes and big ears. The Sacred Harp is many things to many people. Fellowship, religious experience, music, tradition, a sense of family. But I think the thing that impresses any outsider most uh, when they come to the singing is feeling of, of democracy here. Anyone can come and sing and participate without audition. Musical talent, all, although that would be nice, is not, not necessary. Uh, and uh, the singers uh, take turns leading. Uh, they can sing on any part. It's totally democratic.
And uh, until 1920, I, I had never seen her in that community a woman living there who, who sang sacred harp, and some of them could sing better than the men uh, that ever got on the floor to lead. But in 1920, the singing began. Uh, they began to use uh, women in their uh, program, and then it grew from there. There's a real sense of community when one attends any sacred harp sing. For here you find certain rules, perhaps inherent rules, that have grown traditionally, unwritten rules that the group will observe, a certain format for the sing itself. When we first meet in the morning, we usually start singing around 9.30. Some person, usually the chairperson for the year before, starts the singing by leading two songs. Then we have prayer and probably another song. Then we organize the class for the day by electing a chairman, a vice chairman, a secretary, and arranging committee. The secretary makes a record of all the leaders and the songs that they lead during the day. Then we have a recess, usually one or two in the morning, lasting about 10 or 15 minutes each. We break for about one hour for lunch at noon. At one o'clock, we call back together singing for an hour, then have, then have another recess, and then sing until 3 o'clock. Then the class is dismissed by the ter chairman who leads one song, and finally by a prayer given by someone who has been chosen by the chairman. We look forward to cooking, fixing for her. They'll get up and make the welcome address, you know, and every time nearly the burden falls on the women, and I correct them because it's not a burden. To me, it's not to cook the same. It's, that you, it's a pleasure to cook and know that I'm going to feed my friends. My mother, she'd fix, we didn't have boxes in, we had trunks full of food. They'd start to cooking three or four days and they stack up pies, egg custard with straws between them, up this high. And they were put, all this um, sweets were put in what we call them top of the trunk, you know. And then down at the bottom, your food was put in. And whenever I was a boy, though, whenever I was a young fella and had a good appetite, I, that's what I liked the best of all, is to go to the table and pick out some very fine well, you to some pies, uh, egg custard or, or apple pie, and I could enjoy that very much. And always, they were always there, I've been plenty. But that has got to be a custom uh, that we carry our dinner. We carry our, uh, because of the fact that we can't stay at a singing all day, and uh, some people would get very hungry. And the mother and father is not training these children how to go to singing, they train them how to go to the, to the ball game or the picture show or something that ain't no good. They're not training them how to come to the singing. They don't train them. These children, what I brought you today from Oviana, they was taught by their mother to come and bring them here to learn how to sing. Well, we enjoy it as a family and I thank God that my children do love it. I could tell the first time I ever saw them direct a song or lead a song when they were about, oh, I guess 10 or 12 years old, that they had rhythm, they had feeling, and they had a, a love for it, even at a very young age. They didn't, I didn't tell them they had to love it, they just do love it, and I thank God for that. Not too many of my friends sing, just a few here and there, you know, throughout the southeast. At Georgia and Alabama, I have a few that sing, you know, but as far as regular, there's none. 
Um, I don't know. This not too many young people's interested, but we're trying, you know, to get the young people interested by having young people singing conventions and uh, singing schools to teach, you know, young people how to sing. So we're trying. You would think you would get tired of it over and over and over, you know, every weekend, but you don't. It uh, it just you have a feeling inside of you that you just just like sit there and, and see how high or see how low you can get, and just it, it's like the spirit, you know, puts the spirit into you. But I believe in any generation, music is a reflection of the society. And I believe a great case can be made for Sacred Harp, not only historically, but in that more elusive thing called spiritually. I believe a case can be made for Sacred Harp, not only historically, but spiritually as well. How did the Sacred Harp hymn book come to be in the first place? Well, religious freedom is a keynote in the history of the entire Sacred Harp tradition. One may look back to the founding of the Plymouth Colony in 1620. Our pilgrim forefathers sought a refuge from the religious persecution they had faced in England. They set sail from Holland and brought with them as one of their most prized possessions the Ainsworth Psalter. The Ainsworth Psalter contained hymns which were based on scripture, which was metrically set to music. As time passed, the colonists felt the need for a hymnal which would allow greater religious expression. And so, the first book published in America was the Bay Psalm Book. During the 1800s, a religious revival swept over the country, a great awakening. As religious feelings intensified and people began to experience their religion in a more personal way, the need for new hymns arose. There was a growing dissatisfaction with the older and more staid hymnody. New ways must be found to share personal testimonies. Secular tunes were used as a backdrop for the poetry which was written out of individual experiences. Often, these new hymns were published frequently in the newspapers of the day. Even in the early quarter of the 18th century, there was still a scarcity of printed hymn books, and so consequently, a precentor would line out the hymns at singing schools or in worship services, so that the people could learn the hymns by rote. By the mid-19th century, the singing schools came into full bloom and fruition. Singing schools developed because, well, because there was a need for them, just as new hymnody developed because there was a vacuum and a felt need for expression. Singing schools enabled people who were basically unlearned and unread to read music. The singing school brought together people, many of whom were unlearned and unread, and taught them through the unique system which is still in effect today, the fossil law system, in which notes of the scale were given shapes the people learned the shapes and thus could read the notes. Fa, a triangular shaped note. So, an oval shaped note. La, a square. Then again, fa, so, la. And then the leading tone, mi, was a diamond. And so you have the unique scale that is still extant, a scale by which people are still learning to read music. Shape notes, fa, so, la, fa, so, la, mi, fa, and that's the, the, the scale. Four 
shaped notes build up in the scale. Fa, so, la, fa, so, la, mi, fa. Fa is the dominant chord or the foundation of the scale. What do they look like? Well, fa is, is, has three corners to it, and a la has four, and a sol has a round notes, and a mi is a diamond shape. Fa, sol, la, fa, sol, la, mi, fa. Fa, sol, la, fa, sol, la, mi, fa. Now you can put it to the seven shapes if you want to. I sing the seven shape, same as I do the four shape. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, seven shape note. And uh, they swap positions on the scale there when you use the seven shape. And you take uh, uh, oh, Amazing Grace, for instance, called New Brittany. And, uh, you work. Uh, so do mi do mi re do la so la seven say. So fa la fa la so fa la so. It doesn't change the music any. It just changes. You take four four notes and and, uh, and make the music and the chords uh, where it takes seven in the modern book. It's composed of, of four separate parts. All bass, alto, treble, and tenor. Tenor is the leading part of the music. And then the bass, of course, and the alto, and, and the and the tribble. It's written on four stags. Well, all of Sacred Heart music, everything in it, if you stop and you listen to the words, everything, it, it's, it's nothing sad, it's all that, you, that you're just passing through. And then it's, you know, it's just a place here and you're going somewhere else and it's going to be so much better. And that's, that's the whole thing about Sacred Heart music. Of course, I don't got my funeral plan. Yeah, won't be no, won't be no preaching. No preacher won't be at my funeral. He may be there, but all he'll do is pray. They're gonna sing over me 30, 40 minutes, Sacred Heart. In this book I'm talking about, it'll be spread open on my casket instead of on the stand. It'll be, that's going to be the, it, my family wreath and the family is the singers. And, it, and they'll just sing about 30 or 40 minutes. And I want everybody in church to sing and I want them to stand up. No preacher. <laughs> I might have somebody to pray if they see fit, somebody to pray about other. Otherwise, it'll all be singing. I really believe that it's the role of universities on the American scene today to be not only preservers of the past, but also to be uh, purveyors of the art itself. Inherent in Sacred Harp, I believe, are some, some of the great values that we need saving in 20th century America, rapidly rushing towards century 21. Some skeptic might say, well, what can something that was popular back in the 1840s and 50s and 1900s and 1920s or even 1950s have uh, relevancy toward uh, today's living? Well, I personally believe that there are certain basic human values which need preserving. The home, man's faith in his God, honesty, all the good things of life about which so many times we strive and work so hard in this mad rush of 20th century living and so frequently lose.
sake of God. This we thank you for in Jesus' name.